So if you can remember back before the midterm, we were on the topic of signal encoding techniques where we went through, we got through three or four ways to converting data into signals. When we have either analog or digital data and can transmit either analog or digital signals, then we need to map the data to signals. And we've got one, one that we didn't cover that we'll cover today. But before we go through those signal encoding techniques, just a, a reminder or a refresher about some aspects of analog and digital data. Just a couple of slides I want to highlight in this set. Uh, so remember, data is the information we want to get from one entity to another. That's what we want to communicate. It's about data communications. And we can classify data as either analog or digital. And examples of analog data, uh, voice, video, some sensor data. Let's say we have some sensor that records the temperature in, in the room or the, the air, uh, what the air conditioner is doing. So it can get a continuous recording of data at this, over, over time. Whereas digital data takes discrete values. And the best way to think about that is something we represent in binary. Okay, so a, uh, a text file, um, some data that reco record uh, into discrete values. But we transmit signals across our transmission system. And those signals represent the data. And there are two types of signals that we can talk about, analog or digital. In fact, all of our signals in, in the fundamental form are analog. But we can think of digital signals as pulses, for example, a pulse of electricity, send uh, plus 5 volts for some period of time, and then send minus 5 volts for some period of time, where that can be used as a, that represents a digital signal. So we have continuously varying analog signals and discrete values for digital signals. Sometimes we also talk about, and, and the signals represent the data, and the four signal encoding techniques which we're covering are how do we map data to signals. Sometimes we talk about analog and digital transmission, but we will not cover that today. There are a few slides on it, but let's, let's move along in this course and, and get into some other aspects. This is just an example of analog data. And if you remember maybe one of the last few questions in the exam in the midterm, there was something about AM and FM radio. And one of the questions was, uh, you've got some music and you want to send using AM or FM, which one's better? Something related to this picture. This picture shows the spectrum of an example form of analog data, in this case audio. So a very common example. Remember the spectrum shows on the horizontal axis the frequency and on the vertical axis the signal strength. Here it's in decibels but it's a measure of signal strength. So it's a, a plot of data in the frequency domain. And the, the two ones to focus on, the first one is the solid green line which is the, the range of human voice, speech. So an example of audio data is speech when someone's talking. And what this figure shows, this green line, it says that when people talk, the frequencies of the audio that they generate range from around here, around 100 hertz, up to about here, which is, you have to be careful, this is a, a logarithmic scale, so several kilohertz, a bit less than, less than 10 kilohertz. Okay, so it's saying that when you talk, the frequencies that you generate are in the order of 100 hertz up to maybe 5 or 4 or 5 kilohertz. And in fact, most of the frequencies, the, the stronger signal strength uh, when this line is at the highest around this area. When you talk, you don't generate uh, audio at 100 kilohertz. That frequency is not generated by the human voice. So if we want to transmit this analog data, the human voice, through a, as a signal, then using an analog signal, which is like using AM or FM, where we take analog data and transmit using an analog signal, we would need a signal which has a bandwidth which is large enough to carry the human voice. 
So what's the bandwidth of human voice? It ranges from about 100 hertz up to this point. Uh, again, logarithmic. Let's say it's... Uh, what's here? What two? Let's say it's 4 kilohertz. Be careful. A logarithmic, it's very... It's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. So let's say it's 4 kilohertz, just for example. Because we actually we use that number later. Uh, so the bandwidth of voice is about 4 kilohertz. If it ranges from 100 hertz up to 4 kilohertz, what's the difference? It's about 4 kilohertz. 4,000 hertz minus 100 hertz is 3,900. Let's say about 4 kilohertz. So the bandwidth of voice is about 4 kilohertz. So if we want to transmit that, we would need an analog signal which also has a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz. And that was related to the question in the exam. It was saying, which one's better, AM or FM? Well, I think in the question in the exam, AM had a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz and FM had a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz. Actually, the exam was about music. All right, let's see music then. Music has a higher bandwidth, it contains a higher range of frequencies than voice. So there are higher frequencies up to maybe about 20 kilohertz. And some lower frequencies, so for the very low frequencies in music, down to tens of hertz, 10 or 20 hertz. So the bandwidth of music goes from, say, 20 hertz up to about 20 kilohertz, which is approximately a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz. 20,000 minus 20 is about 20,000. So the bandwidth of a human voice is about 4 kilohertz. The bandwidth of music, which has a higher range of frequencies because our ears can, uh, can make sense of the higher frequencies than what's produced by uh, the human voice, so frequencies from different instruments. The bandwidth of music is about 20 kilohertz. And I think that was the exam question. If you want to send music through AM or FM, if the AM radio channel has a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz and FM has a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz, which one's better? Well, FM. Because FM can contain all the frequencies of our data, our music. Whereas with AM, if we want to transmit 20 kilohertz of data, data with a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz, then if we transmit that over using a signal which has a bandwidth of just 10 kilohertz, we can't send, and in particular we cannot receive some of those frequencies of the music. So we'd, you would not receive all frequencies of the music if you use the, the lower bandwidth AM. So we need a signal that is large enough to carry the bandwidth of our data in that case. We'll see this when we look at the next encoding technique. So the exam question was about AM and FM, analog data using analog signals. But the one that's remaining is if we have analog data, the same, music, uh, voice, other types of analog data, but we want to send them as digital signals, as some discrete values. Well, what we do is, in fact, we just convert that analog data into digital data. So we'll use this, we'll refer to this data, this information again when we look at uh, the next encoding technique. The diagram also shows, for example, your home telephone line. So the green lines are the data, the home telephone line allows for signals with a bandwidth of about this range, which is around 3 kilohertz, 3 close to 4 kilohertz, which is designed to carry human voice. So the home fixed landline telephones were designed for people talking. So the signals that can be transmitted across those telephone lines are close to what's created by a human when they speak. That was the idea. If you try and send music across your home telephone, you try and play uh, some CD and, and play it into your telephone and hope that the other person at the other end receives that music, they will receive the music but some of the frequencies will not be delivered to the destination because the telephone line only sends this range of frequencies, 
all of the music in the higher frequency range or the lower frequency range would not be delivered to the destination. So we need to design a system that will support the data that we want to send. That's all I wanted to say about, oh actually there's, just to remind us the, the four techniques. Everyone knows ASCII table. This is just an example of digital data. If we want, say we have some text, some English characters, some message, we can convert it to bits using say an ASCII encoding or other encoding techniques. Just the, these two slides remind us the, the four combinations. If we have analog data and we want to send analog signals, one example of that is your telephone, your home telephone, not your mobile phone. If you've still got one at home. Not many people have nowadays. But you talk, produce analog data, and the signal sent from the telephone across the telephone line would also be an analog signal. But if you connect your computer and you want to use home internet access, then you'd use a modem. Your computer generates digital data, which goes into the modem, and the modem transmits an analog signal across the telephone line. So a modem performs modulation and demodulation to convert digital into analog. What were the techniques that a modem used? Anyone remember from how do we convert digital into analog? Remember shift keying, amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, and phase shift keying, where we, we change the amplitude, frequency, or phase of our analog signal to represent the digital data, the zeros and ones. So we've covered that technique. Analog data is analog signals, AM, FM, and, and sometimes PM, phase modulation. The last one, digital data using digital signals. Which techniques? And remember the acronyms? The first signal encoding technique we went through. NRZ, non-return to zero, Manchester encoding, bipolar AMI. Those techniques took bits, zeros and ones, our digital data, and generated a digital signal. Okay. So the techniques used by a digital transceiver, a transmitter and receiver, uh, like we described in uh, those signal encoding techniques. The last one is what we want to cover today. We've got analog data like audio, but we want to send a digital signal. Well, what we actually do is we take that analog data and convert it to binary. We digitize the analog data, convert it into bits, and then once we have the bits, we can send a digital signal using NRZL, bipolar AMI, or some other technique. So the way to convert analog into binary, we encode the analog data and at the receiver we decode. So we get a coder and decoder or a codec is the name of the component. We're going to cover just one type of codec, a very common type of codec for converting analog into, into digital. And we'll go to that now, which is on our other set of slides, signal encoding techniques. So jump forward to signal encoding techniques. And the third approach, analog data transmitted using digital signals. And in fact, what we do is we take the analog data, convert to digital data and then transmit digital signals. So in general, we can take the analog data, convert to digital, and then transmit, say, using NRZ as a digital signal. Another thing that we commonly do is convert analog data into digital data and then send that data as an analog signal, like phase shift keying. It's common today in communication systems to treat everything as digital data. 
even if it starts off as analog, like your voice, it's much easier for a computer to process the digital data. So convert your analog voice into digital voice. And that's what your mobile phone does. When you talk on your mobile phone, you're creating analog data. There's a codec inside your phone that the speaker records your voice, sends it to the codec, and the codec converts that into binary, into zeros and ones. And then those bits are sent from your mobile phone to the cell phone tower. So this part, we focus on, well, how do we do the conversion from analog data to digital data? And it's performed using a codec. Converts the encoding, converts analog into digital, and the decoding recovers that analog from the digital data. Converts digital back into analog. In this topic and this course, we'll cover just one technique, a very basic one called pulse code modulation, PCM. Delta modulation, there's a few pictures of, but we will not cover. And it's quite simple. And we'll go direct to an example to show the idea, and then we'll go through a couple of examples to explain it in depth. Think of the solid line here, this curve, as the analog data. It's some rep representation of the data that we want to send. For example, a recording of voice over some short period of time, some period of time on the, the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we have the signal strength or the data strength. So as you talk over time, the strength of the data goes up and down. And that's what this plot shows. Just a, a small portion. We want to take this analog data and convert it into binary. And the way we do it is that we take samples at regular intervals. So we, we record the value of the analog data at a sample point, and then take that value and convert it into a binary value. And then at the next sample point, some time later, we record the value and convert that into a binary value, and that's our digital data. So that's the conversion. We just keep doing that at regular sample intervals. So in this picture, the sample intervals start at the first uh, point, time zero, and then at these vertical lines, sample points at these locations. Now, we record the, the strength of the signal the height, really, and convert that into binary. To do that, we must have uh, a discrete, some discrete values to convert to binary. We cannot have a continuous range of values. So the common way to do it is to think, OK, what's the minimum possible level of the signal? And in this example, think of it as the bottom line here. This bottom line on the graph is the lowest possible level of the signal. And what's the highest? Well, that's the top line. And on the right-hand side, there's some scale. We break it into, or at the minimum, we set at 0. And in this example, the maximum we set to 16. So we're saying that the, our analog data ranges between 0 and 16. We will see later we can change those. It doesn't have to be 0 to 16. It can be 0 to another number. But we assign some scale to the, the vertical axis. And a linear scale in this case. So, looking at this right hand axis, at the first sample point at this time, we record the signal strength and we look on the axis what's the value? It's about 1.1. 1 .1. Okay, you look closely, you'll see it's about. 1.1 on this axis, and that's recorded here. The next sample, we look at the signal strength and look across, and it's about 9 point something, 9.2. And we keep doing that for each sample point, 15.2, 2.7 at the, that last sample point. And we'd keep going if there's more data. So all we do so far is map the signal strength into a, a linear scale. We assign some numbers to it. 
But we don't want to have decimals. We just want to have discrete values. And in this example, we want to have values ranging from 0 up until 15. And you'll see the why in a moment. Well, you may guess already. It, 0 to 15. So what we do of those values that we originally get, 1.1, 1 .1, 9.2, we really map them to the nearest value between 0 and 15. And that's tried to be shown on the, the left-hand axis here, that any value that falls within this range will be mapped to the code number 0. So any value that's between 0 and 1, think of we, we use the floor function. If it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.467, we'll just map it to 0. Any number between 1 and 2, we'll map it to 1. Any number between 15 and 16, 15.7 15 or 15.2, for example, we'll map to the discrete value 15. And that's what this row of values show here, that the first sampled point was 1.1, which, as a discrete, we call it a code number, is code number 1. The next one was 9.2, which becomes 9. 15.2, 15.2.7 here is within this third row, maps to 2. Now we have sampled values where the values range from between 0 and 15. There are 16 possible values. Therefore, we can represent those 16 values, any of those values, using a 4-bit binary value. And that's what we get in this bottom row here. 1 becomes 0, 0, 0, 1. 9, 1, 0, 0, 1. And 2 at the end, 0, 0, 1, 0. And now we've finished our pulse code modulation steps of taking analog data, taking samples, and each sample is mapped to a 4-bit digital value. So the digital representation of this analog data is this sequence of, what, 28 bits. 4 by 7 samples. Or 7 samples, each of 4 bits in length. Any questions on PCM? Pulse code modulation. You've you probably used it in a number of cases. Maybe not so common now, but probably if you've listened to a CD, you've you've listened and, and you've seen pulse heard at least pulse code modulated audio. Any questions? Yes? Not yet. So I expect one later if it's not yet. Okay. There are some some things in this example which may not be clear or why do we have 16 values and so on? Well, that's just for this example. The idea is that we want to map the signal strength into discrete values. So we choose a range and really we choose between 0 and 15. So each sample is going to be mapped to an integer between 0 and 15. And once we have one of 16 values, we can represent that in a 4-bit binary number. There are two things, two parameters in this case. The sample interval, the time between samples, and the number of code numbers or the number of levels that we used here. In this example, we use 16 levels, but we don't have to use 16. And we'll see that will have an impact upon what happens when we send the data. Let's go through some, some other examples of the, the same technique. And if you flick forward a few pages, you'll see these other handouts on uh, just a few other examples on pulse code modulation, which will make this hopefully 100% clear once we get to the end.
we'll go through some simplified examples and then start to look at what the impact of those parameters of the sampling interval and the number of code levels have on our reproduced signal. But first, before I, we look at those examples, let's try and I'll just draw a picture just to show what happens with respect to the communications. So the idea is that we start with some analog data. And we want to transmit that analog data to the receiver, who's of course going to receive eventually some analog data. And the example that's maybe easiest to think about, think of the source analog data as you speaking into a, a microphone. And the, the received analog data is what's played back on some speakers, maybe at your friend's phone. Okay. So with PCM, we take that analog data and we use the algorithm of PCM to convert it into digital data. So the output of PCM is a sequence of bits. So and then we send those bits. So this all happens at the source, at, at your computing device. The conversion happens inside the source. Then we have a sequence of bits, and we can use any of our existing techniques to send that across a link. So we can send it as either a digital signal and the techniques that we've got for example NRZ and the others or we could even send it as an analog signal it's not so important with respect to PCM e.g. phase shift keying and those other approaches so we're focusing only on the conversion from analog data into digital data and the conversion back. How we send it across the link doesn't matter in this case. So the receiver receives that and converts back. And of course, I forgot to draw, what it receives after it receives a signal, it has digital data. So we start with our, for example, voice, analog data. We convert it to bits. We send those bits using some form of signal, digital or analog. We receive a signal which is converted back into bits, the digital data, and then PCM, the decoder, converts that digital data back into analog. For example, if it's your mobile phone, the, the decoder on your mobile phone has a sequence of bits as input and converts it back to analog and plays it on the speaker on your mobile phone, so you hear some audio. That's the analog data. we went through or the process for converting to digital data is we take samples and convert those samples to bits and at the receiver the decoding is when you receive the bits so you receive zeros and ones you produce as an output some analog signal as an, or analog data at different levels and the idea is that the analog data at the receiver is an accurate reproduction of the original analog data. Ideally it would be the same. What we have at the source and what's played back at the receiver would be identical. But it turns out in many cases we don't need it to be identical and in fact it's hard, it's impossible to have it identical with this approach. 
for example, with voice, when someone talks here, as long as what's played back on the speakers is understandable, then that's sufficient. So the quality of the reproduction, how good is the audio at the, the receiver, uh, may differ depending upon what we do in the encoding and decoding. So given that, we'll look at encoding and then we'll look at, as we receive the digital data, how we decode or reproduce the analog data. And that's what these few examples try and show in a very simple scenario. Here's our original input analog data, what we start with at the source. And for this example, so it varies over time, it's continuously varying. In this example, I assign some time scale. So it's from zero up to about 18 milliseconds, just to give us some, some numbers. And th this is the amplitude on the vertical axis. So what the source does is take samples and maps those sample points to some discrete values. And in the first example, I'm going to assume that the sampling interval is 4 milliseconds. Just for this example. So every 4 milliseconds, we will record a sample. And we'll also assume that we're using 8 different levels, or 8 code numbers. With 8 code numbers, we start at 0 and go up to 7. So I've tried to, try to draw it so that think of these rows here between the dashed lines, any, any value of the signal that falls between the bottom solid line and the first dashed line would map to code number 0. If it falls within this area, it maps to code number 1, and anything above the top dashed line maps to code number 7. I haven't drawn the, the actual values that was on the, on the lecture notes, just to keep it a bit simpler. What's the first set of bits to be transmitted? Bits. I want zeros and ones. And we start at time zero. So the first sample is at time zero. First set of bits. Zero, 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 one. No. Zero, 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 one, no. Again? Zero, zero, one. Okay, so be careful. The first sample point is at time zero. Let's say we start here. We record the sample. What's the actual magnitude? It's, a, it's here. Whatever the value is, we don't really care in this simplified example. We know that it will map to number one as the discrete code number. It falls within this, this range. Maybe it would, the value was 1.3. I haven't given you the scale. But it maps to code number 1. Because we have 8 different levels, 8 possible code numbers, each code number will be represented by 3 bits. So the code number 1 will become 001. Unlike the previous example where we had 16 levels, and four bits, here we have just eight levels, we only need three bits per code number. So the first sample point produces the digital data 001. We could actually send that across the link now. So if you can imagine now someone's talking on their phone, as they talk, the codec, PCM, is recording the input converting it to binary and then sending that binary across the link to the or across the network to the destination. We have a sampling interval of 4 milliseconds, so 4 milliseconds later we record another sample. At time 4 it's just above this dashed line, so it's 6110. And we could send that across the link. We'll look at what the receiver does in a moment. And we get the other sample points here. 
How many bits sent? 15 bits in this case. What's the bit rate? How fast are we sending bits? Every 4 milliseconds we take a sample. Every sample is 3 bits in length. So we need to send 3 bits every 4 milliseconds. How many bits per second? 3 bits in 4 milliseconds. There would be 250 samples in 1 second. So it would be 750 bits per second. We'll see a calculation of that later. But 3 bits per 4 milliseconds. If we keep doing this, we're generating 750 bits per second. And we'd need to send them across the link. Oh, here it is. Our input data, our transmitter, which includes the, the PCM codec, converts that into bits and sends them across the link. And at what rate does it need to send them? Well, one sample is generated every four milliseconds. Three bits per sample. Therefore, three bits per four milliseconds, which is the same as 750 bits per second. Now be careful. I've said data rate here. This doesn't mean it's the data rate of the link. 750 bits per second is the speed that we must send our data to be able to represent this analog data. It's the, think of it as the data rate required for this application, for this data transfer. We'll come back to that when we compare some other approaches. Now, what does the receiver do? It receives the bits and must convert back to analog data. I hope we've got that. Oh, it's here. This is what is reproduced as the analog data at the receiver. How did it do it? At time zero, when the receiver receives the first three bits, which was zero, zero, 001, it produces an analog output at level one. Zero, zero, 001 is level one. And that it maintains, in the simplest way, it maintains that output for four milliseconds. Then, at time four milliseconds, it receives the next three bits, one, one, zero, or six. So the receiver produces an analog output at level six for four milliseconds. And then at level three, one, and two. So the green line here is the analog data at the receiver. This analog data here. So it's played back on the speaker, for example, if it's audio. We want the analog data at the receiver to be a, a good reproduction of what was at the source. Here's a comparison of the two. The blue one is the original analog data. The green one is the received analog data. They're not the same. But you can notice a little bit that the green one follows the pattern of the blue one. It is some sort of rapid jump at the start to some height around 6. And then it gradually goes down a bit and then it starts to go up a bit. So this is only over a very small time scale. So this green line is our reproduction of the input analog data. It's not identical to the input. But we need it such that it's close to. The closer it is to the input, the better the quality of the reproduction, we say. How do we get it closer? How do we get the received analog data to be closer to that blue line? to m make it look like the blue one. Frequency, be more specific, frequency up. Frequency of what? Ignore noise. Noise will have an impact, but in, in this case, it doesn't impact on how we sample. 
the frequency at which we sample. Okay. Here we were sampling every four milliseconds. And you see the output. The simple way for the output is to hold the level for four milliseconds. Because we don't know what's between zero and four. We only know what was at time zero and what was at time four. We don't know if it was up or down, the next sample, until we receive it. Now there's some smarter ways to do it, but this is the, the basic way. So, one way to get closer to the blue line would be to sample more often. Instead of every four milliseconds, let's say every two milliseconds. And we'd get these sampled values. Same number of levels, eight levels, but a sampling interval of two milliseconds. You can go and check the values, but we'd get these, uh, what, 30 bits of data over the same time period. At time zero, it's one. At time two, it's three, and so on. We'd send those bits across our link. The receiver receives those bits and produces an analog output. And we get this. And maybe you can see it's a little bit closer to the blue one. We'll compare them later. Do I have it? OK. Because we're sampling at a higher, inter higher rate, a higher frequency, we get uh, a more accurate representation of the output analog data when we compare it to the input analog data. Any questions so far? What we want to work through is how the different parameters impact upon quality and other factors. The blue one is our original input. Uh, let's check. Have I changed the scale? One, one thing that I haven't really explained is where do these, these levels come from? Okay, so sorry, I'll go back to this one. Uh, the, the green output, which we'll see in a moment, if we have decimal one, the first sample point, then we'll produce, produce an output in the middle of this band here, in the middle of this area. And that's seen here. So it's not the same. Okay? Of course, the input blue line is not the same as the output green line. But we want to approximate it. We want to get as close as possible. Okay. And what we want to do is know what parameters will get us more accurate, get closer and closer. So far we see that increasing the sampling interval, sorry, inc increasing the sampling rate increases the accuracy of the reproduced data. The more samples, the better it will be. What's the disadvantage of higher sampling rate? We send more bits. In, all, in these two examples so far, it's the same analog data. We want to get this blue line from A to B, the analog data. It doesn't change. One of the disadvantages of more samples is that we need to send more bits. To transmit the same original information, we send more bits across the link. That is, we use more resources to send the data. And we'll see some calculations of that to compare in a moment. One last example. We can also change the number of levels. Two millisecond sampling interval, 16 levels instead of eight. Every sample produces a four bit binary value because with 16 levels, we need to have a four bit number. So now we have, what, uh, 40 bits sent during our interval. Four bits every two milliseconds. 
and the receiver receives and produces this. And it's hard to compare across the slides which one's closer to the blue line. This one tries to compare those three cases. Case one was four millisecond interval, eight levels. That's the red one. When you don't see the red one, it means it's underneath. It's underneath the, the orange one here. The case two, the orange or the brownish one is uh, two millisecond sampling interval, eight levels. And case three, the green one, is two millisecond and 16 levels. So changing those two parameters. Case one is this green one, four milliseconds, eight levels. Case two is two milliseconds, eight levels, and case three is two milliseconds, 16 levels, changing the number of levels. Which one is closer to the blue line? Just visually. Case one? Oh, we, all right, maybe easier question. Which one's worse? And which one's the furthest from the blue line? Now, it's a, not a great picture because the red one is actually underneath the other line, say here. But I think you may see that the red one, especially at this point, is furthest away from the, the blue line. And here it is. The red one, the case one, is the worst when we compare it to the reproduced. When we compare the reproduced output analog data to the original, it's the furthest away. Case two and case three, it's hard to actually see visually which one's closer to the, the blue line. Uh, you'd have to do some calculations, but they're very similar, you see. Maybe case two is, is a bit better here, although not at this point. Case three is closer to the blue one here. Uh, maybe the case two is here. So they're very similar. It's hard to visually compare case two and three. But I hope you can see that at least case one is worse than two and three in this case, especially at these points. We want a reproduced signal which is as close as possible to the original signal. How do we do it? Increase the sampling rate, that is decrease the interval, make it have more samples, and increase the number of levels. If you increase the number of levels and increase the number of samples, then you'll get a better quality reproduction at the receiver. That is, it'll be closer to the original. If you had, instead of every two milliseconds, you could try it every 0 0.1 milliseconds, very often have samples, and have a thousand different levels then if you reproduce, it will be very close to the blue one in that case. So in general, the reproduction at the, at the receiver, the analog data we produce at the receiver, when we compare it to the original, we can talk about the accuracy of that reproduced data. How accurate is the reproduced data compared to the original? Well, increasing the sampling... Well, maybe I'm missing a word here. Increasing the, the sampling rate and or levels increases the accuracy. So increase the number of, number of samples, increase the number of levels will increase the accuracy of the reproduction. And you see it in our picture that case three and maybe two are better than case one. What's the trade-off? The trade-off is that if we increase the sampling rate and or increase the number of levels, we need to send more bits for the same amount of original data. That is, we increase the data rate required to transmit that data across the link. 
That's a bad thing. Case 1 required 750 bits per second. It was 3 bits per 4 milliseconds. Just record that. Case 1 was... three bits per four milliseconds. Case two, we had eight levels, so it was still three bits, but we changed the sampling interval to two milliseconds. That is, we have twice as many samples with twice as many samples, we'll have twice as many bits per second. 1,500 bits per second. With case 3, we had 16 levels, therefore 4 bits per 2 milliseconds. which is the same as 2,000 bits per second. In one second there will be 500 samples. One sample, sample every 2 milliseconds, so in one second 500 samples. 4 bits per sample is 2,000 bits per second. For these three cases, with respect to the data rate required, which one's worse? One, two, or three? Hands up for one. So the question is, of these three cases, which one is, has, is the worst with respect to the data rate required? We saw before that case one was the worst with respect to the accuracy, but now with respect to the data rate required, which one is the worst? Hands up for case one. Hands up for case two. Case three? Okay, good. Case three, because even though it's a higher number, this is what we require to send the data across our link or network. The best way to think of it is that we have a link with some capacity maybe 10,000 bits per second. That's our link data rate, 10,000 bits per second. If we're sending some analog data using case 1, we would use 750 out of that 10,000 for our analog data. We only use a small fraction. The rest is left over for other applications, sending web pages, sending other uh, audio, other data. But if we use case 3 of that 10,000, we would use 2,000 bits per second. We'd use a much larger proportion of our capacity to transfer the same amount of data. It's still the same original analog data. So the smaller data rate required, the better. So case 1 is better with respect to the data rate required, but case 1 is the worst with respect to accuracy. And that's our trade-off, really. Increasing the sampling rate and levels increases the accuracy. That's good. But increasing the sampling rate, and you should write rate here, and the levels increases the data rate required, and that's bad. So we need to choose a trade-off that, that meets our requirements of accuracy and data rate required. Questions before we see some other examples? We'll go through one or two more examples of PCM. This was a simple, simple example. Uh, that is, we tried to keep the numbers and the, the signals simple. 
go back to our slides. So the question, or well, the two parameters we have are the sampling rate, how many samples per second, and the number of levels or code numbers. Now the two parameters will impact upon accuracy and data rate required. What are good values? Well, with respect to the sampling rate, Nyquist and others have done analysis and come up with what's called the sampling theorem. And it says in ideal conditions, really, if you have an infinite number of levels, which we don't, but if you used an infinite number of levels, it says if our data, and here it's written as signal, but our data is just another signal, if it has Let's maybe all right. If it if a signal is sampled at intervals at a rate higher than twice the higher signal frequency, let's explain that first. That is, our original data is made up like any signal of different frequency components. Remember voice? Voice range from about 100 hertz up to about 4 kilohertz. So with voice the frequencies range from the frequency components are between 100 and 4 kilohertz. The highest frequency component of voice is about 4 kilohertz. Okay, so the highest frequency component in voice is about 4 kilohertz. This theorem says if we sample at a rate which is twice the higher signal frequency, so the highest for voice is 4 kilohertz, 4,000 per second, if we sample at two times that, 8,000 times per second, then the samples contain all the information in the original signal, which means when we reproduce, we get a perfect reproduction. So this tells us something about what is the ideal sampling rate given some input data. And maybe it's not written in, in the easiest way to understand. If our data has the highest frequency component of 4,000 Hertz, then it says we should sample at 8,000 Hertz, 8,000 times per second, because that's twice the highest frequency component. If our data has a frequency, frequencies ranging from 1 kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz, the highest frequency component is 10 kilohertz, we should sample at 20 kilohertz, twice the highest. That's what it tells us. So if we know what our original data is, in particular the frequencies, we know what the ideal sampling rate is. Here's the example for voice. All right. Voice is approximately between 0 and 4,000 hertz. Remember, hertz is just times per second. Per second, that's what hertz means. So therefore, we should sample at twice that rate. Sample at 8,000 times per second, or 8,000 samples per second, and that would be sufficient if we had an infinite number of levels. When we reproduce, we'd get a perfect reproduction. That's what it tells us. So for voice, if we sample at 8,000 times per second, we get the best quality that we can achieve. If we sample at 10,000 times per second, higher, we will not improve the accuracy. Okay. That's what the sampling theorem tells us. If we go any higher, we can, it's okay, but we will not get better accuracy. If we go less than 8,000, let's say 6,000 samples per second, we will get lower accuracy, lower quality. So if we go at the, the twice the highest frequency component, that's usually sufficient. Now, in practice, we don't have an infinite number of levels. There's no easy theorem to tell us how many levels to use. It's usually done by experiments and tests. Uh, for example, for voice, when people are talking uh, across communication systems, generally 7-bit encoding is enough. 7 bits means there's 128 levels. So a typical parameter with voice is that we sample at 8,000 times per second. And we have each sample represented by a 7-bit value. And we can use that to encode the voice. And that will produce a very accurate reproduction when we play it back, so that the ear will not be able to distinguish between what's played back and the original version. 
For other types of data, you need different number of bits here. I'll show you one more in a moment, but just for that example of voice, we have, let's say that's the case, what's the data rate required for voice then? We're saying with voice, the spectrum is about uh, about 0 hertz, more than 0 hertz, up to 4,000 hertz. So the, the highest frequency component, the highest frequency in, in voice is 4,000 hertz. So the sampling theorem tells us that we should sample at twice that rate. The ideal sampling rate I'll write the ideal sampling rate we don't have to, but it's recommended is twice times 4,000, which is 8,000 hertz or 8,000 samples per second. Just remember, hertz means times per second, times of doing something per second. So we can use it to represent the sampling rate as well, 8,000 hertz. If we, and the recommended number of levels from experiments is 128 levels. Therefore, the bits per sample is 7. Every sample is represented by 7 bits. Again, we could use a different value, but just for this example. What's the data rate required? Well, we have seven bits at 8,000 times per second, 8,000 hertz. It'd be 56,000 bits per second, 56 kilobits per second. So if we sample at that, that ideal rate, 7 bits per sample, 7 times 8,056 kilobits per second. What if we change the sampling rate? In another case, we didn't sample at 8,000, but use 7 bits, but did it at, let's say, 10,000 hertz. then we'd get 70,000 bits per second. And maybe a third example. What if we stick with 7 bits and used a lower sampling rate of, say, 6,000 hertz? We'd get 42,000 bits per second. Three different examples. The ideal sampling rate, plus one that's higher, and one that's lower. And for each of them, the data rate required. Which one is best with respect to data rate required? Just make sure everyone's clear. With respect to data rate required, which one's best? Blue, purple, or green? The lowest one, green. Remember, data rate required is, let's say I have a link that supports one megabit per second. I have a link from A to B 
and the data rate is 1 million bits per second. Then let's go through and see for those three cases how many so this is voice and think of these as as voice calls okay someone's talking on the phone and their their voice is converted to bits and they're sent across our link and let's say we have multiple people at location A and multiple people at location B and they all want to talk with someone else so the question is if we're using the first one, the blue one, how many parallel voice calls could be supported? One voice call requires 56 kilobits per second. If our data rate is 1 million bits per second, how many voice calls could we support using the first case? How would you calculate it? We'll get the calculator out in a moment. So the case of 7 bits at 8,000 hertz, how many voice calls? One voice call requires 56 kilobits. Our link supports 1,000 kilobits. So we get, what, 1,000 divided by 56 gives us 17. 0.8, we can't have 0.8 of a person talking. So we'll round it down to, to 17. We could have 17 people talking at the same time because everyone who talks generates 56 kilobits per second. Our link supports 1,000 kilobits per second. So 17 at the same time. What about for the other two cases? The purple case, someone can calculate for me. How many voice calls? One is 70 kilobits, we have a thousand, we get... Like 40. 14. Correct, it sh should be smaller. Less voice calls, that's worse. In that I've got a link. I want to allow as many people as possible to make a voice call using that link. Well, with the blue one, we can have 17 people talking. With the purple one, only 14. So that's worse in terms of using the link for, for our application of making voice calls. In the green one, Forty-two kilobits per second, we get how many voice calls? 23. Twenty-three voice calls. That's best. The best. Voice calls. So, trying to make it clear that we want a low data rate required. It allows us to use our link for more things at the same time. In this example, the more things are more voice calls. So. The green one's the best with respect to the data rate required. Which one's the best with respect to accuracy? All right. Which one's the worst with respect to accuracy? Hmm? The green one. Okay. The green one. We've got less samples. And we will not try and draw it, but the, the fewer the samples, when we reproduce this, the output analog data, it will not be as close to the original as when we have more samples. So the green one has fewer samples, therefore be less accurate. Which one do you want to use? Of the three, which one do you want? Well... Green one's good with respect to the number of voice calls, that's good, but worse in terms of accuracy. There's no best answer, but be careful. Compare the blue and the purple one. In terms of accuracy, which one's best? In terms of accuracy, they are the same. Okay, the sampling rate of 8,000 hertz is sufficient 
to capture all the information. So going more than 8,000 doesn't gain anything. So going to 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 hertz doesn't help. So 8,000 is sufficient in that case. And because 8,000 produces a lower data rate required than the 10,000, that's better in that case. So don't choose the purple one. If you want high quality, the blue one. If you want more voice calls, the green one. And then that's up to you which one, which trade-off you want to make. Any questions on PCM? I'll leave you a homework task. We'll get started. We will not finish it. A CD. And the, the audio CDs, not a CD with MP3 on it, but the original audio CDs. It uses PCM to encode the, set, the music. And the specs are, zoom in, with an audio CD, there are two channels of audio. What does that mean? Two channels. There's left and right. It's, it's stereo. Which really means there's two streams of audio. Okay, Think of two pieces of audio. That's what two channels or stereo means. Using what's called LPCM, which is PCM, what we're dealing with, linear PCM. There's also a non-linear. 16-bit values. So with CD audio, we use PCM and every sample is represented by 16 bits. How many levels? 16 bits per sample, there's about 65,000 levels. 2 to the power of 16. Okay, So it's not 8, 16, we have 65,000 different levels when we take samples on a CD. That is when someone creates the CD and at the sampling rate of 44,100 hertz. Meaning, every one second, there are 44,100 samples. Each sample is represented by a 16-bit value. And from that, you can calculate how many bits per second for audio. And remember, there are two channels. So you do all that for the left channel, and then you do it all again for the, the right channel. So you do it twice. Here it says the capacity of a CD it varies. How big is a CD in terms of megabytes? Anyone remember? 700, 750 megabytes. All right, let's say it's 750 megabytes. Okay. If the CD carry, can contain 750 megabytes of data, then the question is, how many minutes of audio can it contain? We will not write it down. There are 44,100 samples per second. Every sample is 16 bits, so that's the number of bits per second. We have stereo, so we need to do it twice. So it's se separate audio streams for left and right. So that's the number of bits per second. About 1.4 megabits per second. OK, that's how many bits per second we need to save on the CD. How many bits do we have available on the CD? 750 megabytes. Convert to bytes. 750 megabytes times by 8. Convert to bits. And divide. That is the total size, 750 megabytes, divided by the number of bits per second that we need to write to it.
and that tells us the number of seconds divided by 60 gives us 70 minutes about. Okay? That's why when you have a, a normal audio CD, you can save about 70 minutes of audio on it. It uses PCM, stereo, 16 bits per sample, 44,100 samples per second. If you had a bigger CD or a smaller disc, in terms of bytes, megabytes, you'd have a different number there. Confirm that calculation yourself. Make sure you can do that calculation. Tomorrow we'll summarize what we know about PCM and move on to the next topic. Okay. We'll stop there.